Today on Artist Talk, two super unique minds. The architecture is the place of possibility. I always try to create things that change people's expectations about something that they already know. It becomes a whole different thing. You know, it's an exploration. I would create whole cities with trains and blocks and these building sets. Design is only as good as the thought you put into it. Architecture is an interesting discipline. It's nothing without the person who experiences it. What could be more fun? Oops. Alex Gorlin is an architect known for bringing warmth to his modern designs. His designs can be seen all over the world and include the space we are in today, here in Miami, the Gorlin Building. Daniel Arsham is a contemporary visual artist who blurs the line between art and architecture. His work challenges convention by placing shape and structure in unexpected places. Who were your influences, places, people, structures, and artists? You know, I float around so, in so many different mediums that I have, you know, architects and um, people like Duchamp and artists like Gordon Matta Clark, who were always influential to me because they floated across things. You know, they didn't work in one specific medium or um, vision. Frank Lloyd Wright was a great influence, especially the Guggenheim Museum. So growing up in New York City, going to that space and seeing how architecture could be sculpture and how you move through space in this great spiral, it was very inspiring. And also the work of Le Corbusier, this French architect, who, uh, that was also architecture as sculpture with very bold shadows and forms. And, and those things were like, when I saw them first, I just was so, it was like mind blowing. Also, as an architect, to have this take place in a space I designed in my own apartment is amazing. Because in a way, that's like the culmination of design, where you can create a space and then have people inhabit it and do something in it and really uh, express themselves in that space. We're like sitting in your idea right exactly. now. Exactly. That's deep. So where are you both from, and how did your childhood inform your life in architecture and design? I grew up here in Miami. I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. Moved here when I was young. But I've been working a lot, actually, this year, this being the 20th anniversary of a storm that was here, a hurricane uh, called Hurricane Andrew. Yeah. So a lot of the pieces that you saw in the exhibition in Paris, the ones that are made out of these broken materials, it's kind of about sort of taking this, you know, this shattered glass and reforming it back into something that has a kind of purpose to it or an intention. So the experience of living through that storm and, and nearly being killed in that storm has come up a lot this year for me. I know Andrew because it actually was such a violent storm system that it blew open the zoo here. And that oh, yeah. happens to be the reason why Miami has so many exotic Parakeets. birds. Right. You're, also the parrot jungle right. was destroyed and yeah. they were all let loose. Yeah. That's funny, how do you know that? You're not from down here. I know. But you I just, just heard the story? You saw the, I just was, you saw I was, the parrots flying around? I was and fascinated. I was like, what is this? I mean, I was just so blown away by it. And sometimes there are like, there's an evil genesis to like great social change, right? That's right. You grew up in Queens and you made play cities as a kid. Did you always know what you, that you wanted to be an architect? Uh, well, I was born in Brooklyn, actually. Then I grew up in Queens. And uh, actually, this is one of the models from my childhood, a hydrodynamic Kenner girder and panel set. And at the time, the brochure said that little boys should build ammonia plants or cyanide plants. It was before ecology. So, uh, but it was the act of putting it together in these little pieces and these uh, kind of cylinders that would have water come through it, that uh, just the idea of making something unique and in my parents' living room, I would create whole cities with trains and blocks and these building sets. So I guess from the beginning, I thought I would, it was something I wanted to do. Yeah, it's, how old were you there? Uh, I was seven. Yeah, it's pretty so. clear. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing that you still have that. It's like genius. Mm -hmm. so. Daniel, you work in several mediums. Did you ever go through a period of confusion where you didn't know what kind of art you wanted to make? You know, people ask me this question all the time about why I float around through so many different mediums. So I have my art practice and then I have architecture, which is sort of not really architecture, but somewhere in between the two. And then all of the work that I do in stage, primarily for, for dance. 
I think for me it's really about sort of not being bored but always wanting to kind of challenge and bring in a new thing and you also get the sense that in each discipline that you work there are certain people that have skills that you want to sort of tap you know so in theater there are all of these amazing lighted lighting designers that I've met and you know within the architectural world there are all of these architects and structural engineers and all of these people that can sort of bring something to the other disciplines that I'm working in. So I sort of like to operate in this space that kind of floats across disciplines or in between them. As a musician, I find myself wanting to do other things all the time. And even in architecture, I like to do different types of work. So everything from high-end residential to affordable housing and homeless housing and also religious buildings and synagogues. So all of these kind of inform each other. And I think you have to to maintain your creativity, you have to really uh, constantly uh, be inspired by different sources and different types of projects and programs. Alex, you work with two of the greatest architects of the 20th century, Ian Pei and Richard Meyer. What were the notable difference between Pei and Meyer? Well, they were both very elegant uh, men and they were also somewhat distant. They would come around the office, actually Meyer would come around the office once a day and kind of look at your drawings and make a few scribbles and then walk around. <laughs> and then I.M. Pei was, he traveled so much, he was almost a celebrity in his own office. They both taught me that even the largest project, the, the Louvre or uh, Grand Museum, start with a few lines on a piece of paper. So the concept for anything even the largest of buildings or ideas is, comes from a simple idea that can be sketched by hand. I did work under people and I, you know, I uh, worked with Merce Cunningham for many years and learned, you know, a lot from him in, in, at the end of his life and worked with other artists um, and other architects and I think that being sort of inside someone else's practice, trying to understand how they formulate their ideas is something that's really uh, important. Working under someone else, you get to learn about like crisis, right. man, crisis management, right. which <laughs> in our business hopefully doesn't come around that often. Although it, every it, day it in ends architecture, up, that's yeah. sure. Yeah, in our business, it's uh -huh. just like you know, there's always an right because you're also dependent upon other people. I mean, other people have to manufacture or you know produce something, and it's very much. Uh, you know, you are kind of creating the diagram or the instructions, but then it has to be executed by others. Whereas I think when you do a drawing, it's very much your own hand directly, or... Yeah. And even a lot, a lot of the stuff that architecture makes, you know, we try to keep as, as much of it in-house. I mean, I operate at a much different scale than you. You know, we, we never made spaces like that. Well, we've made spaces that are this size, but they're temporary or you know, I'm thinking of the cavern project that we right. did at Storefront. Um, oh yeah, that was great. We filled the entire space solid with foam and over the course of six weeks with my team, we dug out a space almost like tunneling. Most people think that we had those fabricated outside and most people think that they're done digitally, but in fact the hand is always present in those things. So in architecture, form and function, right? We know that they're very important, but is there one that's a little bit more important to you? Well, right now I like form more. <laughs> I mean, I think form is the most exciting part. And, but you have to choose a form that fits or can uh, relate to the function. Mm -hmm. So there's a constant back and forth between the two. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you analyze the function and then you think of forms that relate to it, but Sometimes that form is not appropriate and you have to change the form or it can deform. And, uh, but it's a constant play between the two. But in the end, I think what people are excited about is the form and the space and the light. So the experience of it. The, form yeah. is, the function is really the beginning. Mm -hmm. I always try to create things that change people's expectations about something that they already know. Mm -hmm. right? So a lot of my work is about sort of reinventing or uh, reforming something that's existing. So I'll take, you know, a, a plain white wall and create a sensation that the wall is doing something that it shouldn't be doing. The, the wall starts to appear almost like fabric or it appears as if it's dripping. Everyone knows what the wall should do and how it should feel and the way that it should function and when it's not doing that thing, 
it creates a very sort of poignant moment where they're able to sort of reevaluate in some ways um, their entire surroundings. It's insane because you picture your piece one way and then when people interact with it, it becomes a whole different thing. Without function, it's, it, I mean, then as pure, then it becomes pure sculpture, I think. Sure. But, I mean, uh, one could argue that the function, you know, of a sculpture is to, oh, yes. it can have a function. Often the times, you know, I sort of define it by things that are touched and things that are not touched or used, right? Um, although it was pointed out to me recently that you're allowed to touch walls, <clears throat> and sometimes <laughs> I install works, <clears throat> you know, that are in a wall. Mm -hmm. So at what point does the work you know, stop and the architecture begin. You know, are, right. you, are you allowed to touch these? People touch the sculptures all the time. They just can't help themselves. That's why I like art in private homes because you can touch them. Sure. <laughs> you said the design isn't predicated on geography. How much does this location inform uh, the design? Uh, all the work I do really has its kind of uh, beginning from the site. So this house I did in Colorado really uh, they originally wanted, in fact, an Italian house, and I came to the site, and it just demanded something that was earthy and uh, built of stone, and so we did something of stone and glass that really looked like it was rising from, the, that had been there forever. For the most part, the inspiration for a building is its location. Yes, oh, definitely. So even this building here, it's all about the site and in framing the view out towards the water and down Collins Avenue, and. You know, people come here and they look out and they say, wow, what a great view. But in a way, it didn't exist until this frame the, was around the it. framing. So the framing and the kind of organization of the view is, creates that view. In your mind, when you're designing things, you design things with a solution in mind. Like not a resolution, but right, a real right, solution right. for a, an issue. What we're doing in this affordable prefabricated housing in Brooklyn, which we've done 300 townhouses already, and there, yes, there was that goal in mind to create housing that was affordable uh, through this prefabricated pro process. So in a way, that was very focused, and then we had to work towards that goal. What does it mean to have architecture uh, perform the unexpected? It's a question uh, for you, but I, know, like, but I, I want to hear what he has to say about it, um, actually. I know it's a well, question I think, for me. Well, uh, I think architecture is the place of possibility. Mm -hmm. So I think architecture, I mean, great architecture allows for anything to happen in it. In, in the affordable housing I did in Brooklyn, the street facades are very designed. And then in the back, there are these alleys for parking cars. And uh, it turns out the back, people have like customized the yards and they've made it their own. And so everyone has their backyard and that's really the place where people gather and uh, interact together and they've kind of made their own uh, kind of creative places. Architecture is an interesting discipline because it's, it's nothing without the person who experiences it, mm -hmm. right? So right. this space doesn't mean anything until someone's inside of it experiencing it and that's part of the um, perhaps the the thing that keeps us grounded, you know, is thinking about it's not about us or what we what we want to create. It's really about who and how uh, we'll experience it. But then there's also this term, uh, star architects. Wow. <laughs> um, well, I think Daniel's point is good because uh, star architecture, at some level, is about the cult of the personality of the architect, and yet the architect knows that it's really not about themselves, it's about what they're doing for others and spaces that they're creating. So I think it's been good in the sense of like bringing architecture the, to the public uh, awareness. <laughs> I just, you know. <laughs> well, speaking of star architecture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some things. Uh, you know, is this one of your room? Uh, I had nothing to do with this. But you know what's so funny? When I hear the term star architect, yes. I think there's like a, a second definition that's like super awesome too, which is um, the study of those who align the stars for themselves. You know what I mean? Yes. That's a new definition for a star architect right. to me. I think this notion of this kind of cult of personality that you're talking about, though, 
there are certain architects that have used it to sort of ill, ill purpose and have kind of done you know bad things with it. But there are others who their entire world becomes part of you know mm -hmm. what they do. So it's not just um, the things that they make, but people's experience in some ways of of, um, of their their buildings is influenced by who they are, right, and their other interests. And this is kind of I mean, it has much more to do with other disciplines like popular music or um, maybe even more within the art world. There's this kind of notion that the person is as important as the work. We know that you're like super outspoken about Hurricane Sandy and uh, some of the issues with the shorelines and that you've had some solutions. What are some of the measures that you think should be taken? Well, I think uh, as in Florida, there are these water levels that are known that things can flood up to and I think all the mechanical and electrical systems have to be brought above that level instead of in the basement where they flood so that people can continue living in these in the apartments that are there and the other is just not to build where it's where one shouldn't really in these zones that will flood. But we also live in a day and age where people just don't take things very seriously until the last minute. Oh, look at Pompeii. <laughs> it was destroyed 2,000 years ago and they have people living there now. Yeah. So what do you think should be done though? Well, I think, uh, I mean, now that we know those areas that are very vulnerable, we have to protect those. And then I, I'm not against some kind of big dam, really, to keep the water back like they do in London or Rotterdam. Well, you know, we maybe. actually could, we could gain some power that way too. Yeah, that's right. It could be kind of a hydraulic thing. They're even doing that in Venice. Well, where would they put it? Oh, like, like at the by, the of the harbor? by the Verrazano Bridge. Yeah. How do you see quality design remaining accessible for those people who can't afford expensive lofts and snow architecture? Now, me personally, I love this conversation because I think that, like, you know, if you're building a mobile home, it can be a terrible, trashy mobile home or it can be, like, next level and super efficient. You could put some thought into it, um, like what you guys are doing in Brooklyn, and, like, change the world. I personally feel like, you know, design is only as good as the thought you put into it. It's not necessarily always, always about the materials. Do well, I also do you work for a group called Common Ground, okay. who does housing for formerly homeless. And they've emphasized design in all of the buildings that they've built in the last five or six years. So they hire better architects. They don't look like homeless housing. They look like like high-end condos or something. That, mm -hmm. and they become landmarks for the community that have actually helped increase the values of the neighboring uh, area. So uh, I think design should be applied across the board. So it's not simply limited to those who have the means, but to every level of society. Daniel, you define your work in dimensions. Can you explain that? I make small drawings. I make objects, I make sculpture, I make spaces, I make stage designs. So I started to think about, obviously, the two-dimensional work as these things that, that exists flat, it's small, it's something that I normally do strictly by myself. Almost every other discipline that I work in is about uh, sort of engaging other people. So the sculpture is three-dimensional. And then the performative work and the architecture, I think of almost as, you know, in the fourth dimension. Mm -hmm. So it's really about time. It's really about experience. You walk through the door. What's the first thing that you experience? Then you get to the next space. Then you're in the bathroom. How does it feel? You know, what's the light like? So the, well, like, the fourth yeah, dimension is kind of time, I guess. Well, well dance and architecture are very similar. Because mm -hmm. they're, as you said, it's moving through space. Mm -hmm. And the dancers themselves create space mm -hmm. with their bodies. Mm -hmm. And so that whole kind of intersection of dance, movement, architecture, space, it's, uh, it's amazing. I mean, actually, architecture just leads into everything. Yeah. And everything so, comes yeah. back to architecture. But maybe that's an architect speaking. What are each of you chasing? <laughs> I mean, you know, I, my interest in, in making form and, and making these things is, is based on a, a desire to kind of understand these things and to have a different sort of sense about them. So constantly driven to be sort of reinventing something or so much of the practice in the studio is really about play, you know. Within the architecture studio, we'll 
sometimes bring in you know a number of different materials and objects you know say like what can this what can this object do that it's not supposed to do there are these kind of objects that have a sort of pot inherent potential within them I think I'm chasing a dream of you know some just to create something that is so incredible I mean I, I still don't think I've created something that really expresses everything that I want to so there's always something wrong but I'm trying to constantly get something that's closer to that perfect vision. And you never end up getting there. You anyways. never get there, but I think you have to you stop it's chasing always, isn't that the cool right. thing? <laughs> you never get there. The payoff is the process. Yes. What do you see yourself in 20 years? Oh, 20 years. Probably living in Miami here. <laughs> My agree. apartment. I agree. <laughs> I'll come back to that. Right. And you? I love that answer, by the way. <laughs> Probably won't be in Miami. <laughs> I grew up here, so it's kind of nice to get out of it and come back. But I don't know, the studio is developing in a really interesting way, and I sort of n could have never thought that it would, that I would be involved in these different disciplines. I was always interested in architecture, but theater has been, and stage has been something sort of really interesting for me to, to become engaged with. So I'm sure the studio practice will grow, and hopefully I can continue in these different sort of disciplines and perhaps. Um, you know, expand my, my interests. But no Miami. I come back here, you know, every year, see my parents. I come back here for the art fair. You'll be back. Yeah. I know you love it here. Yeah. Miami beckons. Yeah, it, it does. I'm good, man. This, was, this has been very educational for me, very informative, and, you know, something for me to learn. And if I'm learning, I know that my viewers are learning. So that's like the most important thing. It's about artists, and that's why it's called Artist Talk, because that's what I want to do. Well, thank you for inviting us. Yeah, my pleasure. Cool, man. Thank you guys so much for being sure. here. Sure. Pharrell Williams here with Artist Talk. Beware, I'm here with the one and only Tony Hawk. I'll do this at all costs, even if I get hurt. You've got to be unafraid of the winter to know that you'll reach the summer. People said I cheated because I ollied into my airs. I was like, yeah! That's how you get hype. We woke up every day trying to find yeah. like a mini half somewhere. Right. The high that, that I go for is when I land something new. That's not really selling out. That's called being successful and being right. a pioneer. I loved all the stuff I did. I really did. And I'm still happy over here on this, on this radius. <laughs> oh yeah. Check it out. Don't miss any episodes or you'll miss things like this. Pharrell Williams here. Hi, I'm Joy Bryant. I'm Eric Ripper. I'm Tom Colicchio. I'm Dr. Frank Lipman. The host of On the Table. The host of Across the Board. Host of Artist Talk. Host of Hooked Up. Host of the show, Be Well Week, Be Well Weekend, on the Reserve Channel. It's only on Reserve. Did you know that you can follow my show on social media sites like Facebook? Follow us on Twitter. If you're a fan of my show, hit the like button. All of the above. Share me with your friends. Treat yourself. You know, check out a new episode of my show, Hooked Up. And if you want to leave comments, feedback, ideas, whatever, love to hear from you. Leave a comment. And if you don't want to miss the show, be sure to subscribe. The one that's like down here, or is it here? Uh, somewhere down here. Thanks for watching the Reserve channel. Only on YouTube. Share me, please. Throw caution to the wind and ask yourself what rules.